Okay, let's go beyond the phony baloney, Kubler-Ross five stages of grief and explore the other side of grief. Let's take the red pill and see what it's like on the other side of wage slavery. Let's see what freedom is like. The first thing I want to look at with you is uh, catharsis. Catharsis is purgation, it's cleansing. It's one of the forgotten words of the noble death after this toxic, toxic wasteland, uh, really a kind of casino of addictions, of million and one addictions that civilization is. Assuming you've got over your leadership addiction, that's the addiction where you get damaged people, essentially people that are traumatized in childhood, and you elevate them in later life so that they reenact their trauma on a national scale. The national leaders, the leaders of industry, the church leaders, all these damaged people that you've idolized and put in control and perpetuate this traumatizing system. Once you realize the system has ended, one of the first stages to go through after the grief of the, the loss that really it's the loss of your ignorance, that everything you thought was the right way up, everybody that you thought was really to be admired is actually to be despised. When you think of the things that are actually constructive, actually destructive, almost every bit of your world is upside down. When you realize that it's past, it's, it's reaching its end game, I mean, just, just look at the jet stream breaking up here uh, in these images over the last few days. This is really, really the death rattle of the Arctic. There's no way that this can be patched up. Uh, there's no fix for, for anything as bad as, as this. So while we still have time, while we still have this wonderful weather, let's go and explore a possible alternative outcome to the one which is where these damaged people, the current leadership, the psychologically uh, broken people actually manage our extinction. And we begin, let's, let's begin to see what it could be like and to, to have an alternative access. Once you've purged those people, literally purged them from the system, then you can start to start on the purgation of the trauma that you've suffered under civilization. The first stage in that is catharsis. So to investigate catharsis, we really have to go back in time to the ancient world. Let's go back in time to the ancient temples where catharsis was performed as part of a holistic healing process. Temples are not situated just anywhere. Nobody sits down one day and thinks, ah, let's build a temple, where shall we put it? Temples are usually built on sacred sites that have been sacred for hundreds and thousands of years before somebody cashes in on them by building a temple on top of them. Here in Kaz at the ancient healing temple of Asclepius, the Asclepian, the temple was built here because it's built in a sacred grove. The reason it's here is because of this tree, the cypress. It's built in a sacred cypress grove. Not only is the environment tranquil and really conducive to healing, but the cypress tree has a very interesting background story in Greek mythology. Cypress trees are traditionally associated with mourning, but more than just mourning, they're an evergreen tree, so they associated with eternal life. So really, you can find them in the Christian and Muslim cemeteries because they symbolize not only death, but rebirth into an everlasting afterlife. I always normally play this game whenever I go to one of the temples in, in Greece, and I try and figure out what the original site was. So. Most people come to see all the columns and the, you know, the grand stuff, but I'm always on the hunt for the original uh, local feature that's probably a geographical natural feature, often a sacred lake or a grove of trees or a lookout point on a hill. Uh, so, for example, in Delos, there's a lake 
a sacred lake uh, that must have been a tranquil place that you can probably imagine hominids going to for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, then you can see the sacred grove of cypress trees must have been a place where people came, uh, maybe sick people uh, that thought they were going to die, was, uh, that, that would be a, a natural place to go and, and prepare for death. Um, in uh, Delphi, there's the, the Hi Hiberian Spring that really must have been the original feature that people came to. Um, you can imagine Neanderthals almost coming uh, as a healing spot. Now, what they were healing was a dissociation. So it's really a dissociation with nature, with, with life. Uh, so as I've said many times before, that dissociation comes because of our increasing alien cortex. Basically, as our intellect develops, it becomes dissociated from the rest of the brain and really it, it gets this attention deficit disorder and it really hives off into its own world, into its own bubble. And that's the initial cause of addiction, of depression, of mental diseases is really this split. Now, in very ancient times, uh, you can well imagine going to a peaceful place like a, a spring, a natural spring, and bathing in the spring. It's, an, you know, it's, it's a nature therapy. And it brings you back in touch with the natural world. Even today, uh, if you go psychotic, one of, the, one of the primary medicines is lithium. So the treatments uh, for psychosis is, is lithium. Now, any spring is full of lithium. It's basically a, the ancient text tell of if you are psychotic is go and drink, uh, you know, sit in a quiet grove, drink the water from a bubbling spring, bubbling over the rocks. Lithium basically is, is rocks. So, uh, yeah, the ancient treatment goes back into primordial history. Now, Aslepia seems to be a real person. The name Aslepius means to rip open, and legend has it that he was born by a Caesarean section. Eventually he became a, a god, he had a cult following, but it seems that he really was an early doctor, and he would heal people probably at these already sacred sites that eventually became these Aslepians, these uh, hospitals. In those times, healing was very holistic. They didn't think of it like we do today as basically something wrong with your body. They had a, an idea of the body, mind, psyche. And the Aslepians had libraries, gymnasiums. They, uh, they had theaters, which was part of, uh, part of purgation. Part of catharsis was also in the theater. What... Uh, what you would do going to see movies today. So that idea that uh, healing involved mind, body and spirit was, uh, was quite advanced and, and it's backed up by science today although we just treat the body now, we don't bother with the, the psyche too much. Uh, there's not much profit in it. In, in those days there was some profit in it and that's what the temples were about. So. When you went to one of these uh, temples, say the one in Epidavros or, or Kos, it would start off with a catharsis. So what that was was a purgation. They would give you emetics uh, to make you, you vomit. In essence, poison you. And the idea was that you would get out emotionally and physically uh, all the toxins. So imagine that in terms of civilization. It means that you go cold turkey, you get rid of the, uh, all the, the, the bad mojo in, in your system. That was the first stage. Once uh, you'd been through purgation, then you go through uh, this dormitory phase. So in the dormitory phase, then, you were supposed to be visited in your dreams by the uh, god Aslepius himself, or maybe one of his daughters, Hygienia or Panacea, for example. Those are two words that are still with us in, in the medical realm. 
but that dream then would be interpreted by a priest and he would decide what the therapy would be. So the therapy could be something uh, like modern surgery, including opiates uh, as, as sedatives and anesthetics. Uh, it might be exercise in a gymnasium. It might be a series of baths. Uh, the, the actual temples had libraries and they had places for exercise. Catharsis and purgation included uh, theater, mind, uh, just, just reflection, uh, philosophizing, including mulling over things that required a library. So uh, a very a very nice and holistic view of the healing process. Now apparently Aslepius was far too good at his job and he eventually got so good at healing people that he was bringing dead people back to life and as legend has it uh, that wasn't doing much good for business in Hades so Zeus uh, struck him down with a thunderbolt and he became one of the really the 13th constellation in uh, in the zodiac so that's the story of the the first hospitals so Aslepius was essentially cashing in and when you went to one of these um, Aslepians uh, it was a commercial activity it really was a, a money spinner so they really got hold of the curative spring the whatever the sacred place was uh, the kind of lords of its day, then they would cash in and you were supposed to pay them back with uh, some, some kind of sacrifice um, to, to the treasury. So cults is one of the things that I know quite a bit about and the Aslepian and Aslepius himself must have been a cult leader. So let me tell you about part of my epiphany in um, why the world is upside down and how I started to develop this theory about the alien cortex and how the alien cortex has created civilization. Alien cortex will ultimately kill all of us. And in, in essence, what's happening in the Aslepians is they bringing the alien cortex back from attention deficit, bringing it back to heal, really serving the rest of the brain. Uh, the older part of our brain, the part of our brain that's really in connection with the, the wider world, with, uh, with nature, and really more grounded. Then this more abstract part, the more intellectualizing part that tends to drift off in its own world of, of simulations, in uh, time simulations, historical and forward-looking um, abstractions, really this nutty professor world that really is part of the virtual world that our society has slipped into, especially with its brainchild now, the virtual world uh, emblematic with, um, or epitomized by silicon and the internet. So let me tell you the story about how I started to formulate this idea about the alien cortex and how it's terribly terribly dangerous for for our species and now as you can see with global warming we've essentially it's taken us to a spot that we can't get out of it, it this has wiped out our species and probably our planet uh, it's too late to do anything about but it's part of healing and catharsis is to purge ourselves of its control so at the very least we could do that in part of our, our noble death. But let me tell you the story about how I was in this, this uh, cult in my formative years from the age of about 15 to the age of 22. I was in a cult and my, uh, my mother studied comparative religion and she did her thesis on my experience in this, this cult. So a wonderful time. I, I would highly recommend being in a cult to anybody. But uh, yeah, so the moment where I started to have my, my doubts about the intellect, IQ, and started to think our, our worldview is completely upside down, and what's inverted it is this intellectualizing part of our brain. So we used to sleep about four hours a night as part of a, a practice of austerity. We'd get up 
uh, at four by four in the morning for many years I was uh, in a study group studying meditating chanting doing all these uh, essentially ascetic practices uh, and one of the things we did, would do is uh, study philosophy and particularly Socrates uh, at four in the morning so I remember particularly this one moment of epiphany that I had and it was studying the Phaedo so what the Phaedo is 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 Plato's book about the last days of Socrates now Socrates in this cult was really almost a godlike figure he was idolized by by us now in the Phaedo really Socrates reveals his entire philosophy of life he he has his moment of revelation in his final words so if you don't know the story of Socrates I'll just recap he was condemned to death by the Athenians by the Athenian council for corrupting the youth and introducing false gods into Athens now he had the opportunity to escape a death sentence anybody that was sentenced to death was really given ample opportunity not to carry out uh, they had to kill themselves they were given a lethal dose of hemlock which is a poison and uh, they would have to drink it and that would be the the death sentence but uh, you had a number of opportunities to just make a run for it and go to another city and uh, Socrates had that opportunity he had a rich friend called Crito and Crito organized his escape route so here it gets very interesting because the cult I was in was extremely extremely against suicide suicide was a big sin a big no-no and if you asked why they'd say well they were kind of cryptic and then say well you are not allowed to commit suicide because the gods are angry you have to think of it in terms of a cow uh, that kills itself in the night and then the farmer comes to milk it in the morning and it's not there so it says volumes about a cult the fact that really it's just uh, all about milking you <laughs> for, for, for one thing <laughs> but in essence then let's go back uh, to to Socrates uh, and then the first thing that's a little bit disturbing from the point of view of um, me as a very devoted acolyte of this cult is that really Socrates did commit suicide he had the opportunity to escape and that was the first thing that disturbed me is that Crito set it up so that he could escape and in the Phaedo which we were studying uh, he chooses not to escape why because he has this long convoluted justification that you should obey the law and he did it as a lesson to his pupils and it wasn't really very convincing but my real moment of epiphany was the uh, his final words so his final words were Crito we owe a cock to Asclepius pay the debt and do not neglect it and those were his final words then he took the poison and then he died right so what do those words mean well my guru the the person who was instructing me in that cult interpreted those words and part of the religion of the cult was that you yeah that's stolen from Hinduism that you were reborn and reborn till you achieved a perfect life and then once you achieved that perfection you would stop being reborn and that was really a worthy goal um, so the, he interpreted so my cult leader uh, my guru interpreted it in those terms that you can't have a single debt you have, can't have even you can't owe anybody a brass farthing if you die owing somebody a brass, fa brass farthing you will be reincarnated to pay them back you must, if you had any karma whatsoever any debt that debt would require a human reincarnation so that you could pay down that karma and only when your karmic slate was clean could you actually be released from rebirth uh, basically a, a crib from Hinduism 
And so he read that in, ter in terms of what Socrates was saying was, was, he was saying, well, you know what? I owe a debt of a cock to Asclepius. Uh, so, you know, Crito, make sure it's paid down so that I don't be reborn. The assumption being that we were supposed to assume that somebody of Socrates' caliber would not be reborn. That would be his final life. Uh, and, uh, yeah, his karmic debt would be paid in such a noble life as he had. At that moment, I suddenly realized that my guru didn't know who Asclepius was. You see, that's not at all what Socrates was saying. And let me explain. You see, when you went to the Asclepian and Asclepius healed you, then a traditional sacrifice that you gave in payment was a cock, a rooster. So, saying that Socrates owed a debt of a rooster or a cock to Asclepius was, meant that he had just recovered from a disease. What he was saying, I suddenly realized, was that he was a philosopher. He was nihilistic. He thought of life as a disease. And he thought of Asclepius now with death by taking hemlock, by committing suicide. He was, in essence, getting rid of the disease of life. And I suddenly thought, wow, this is all wrong. This is completely upside down. And I started to realize, far from Socrates being great, I, he was afflicted by this disease of the brain. So I started to realize that in a life-affirming way, the only thing that really matters is life. But here was the total negation of life. What Socrates was doing was committing suicide, con considering life a disease, being more nihilistic than you could possibly imagine. And I thought, hang on, there's something wrong. Gradually, I started to formulate this idea that what Socrates had been taken over, the real disease, was his alien cortex. So he shouldn't have been committing suicide because of his principle. He should have been making the part of his brain that comes up with principles and dies for them. That was the evil part. That was the sick part. And that's the part that we've built a civilization on, the part that is principled, the part that thinks abstractly. And that's the evil part. So what the Asclepian was doing was really healing you from this disease of the brain, the alien cortex, particularly on the left side here. This part that abstracts, uh, it speaks, it conceptualizes, it argues, it philosophizes, and it questions. It forms religions is an engineer and it destroys planets and it destroys species and it wants to be free of life so much so that it's actually willing the death of nature so this part of our brain is not only a misanthrope it doesn't only hate people it hates nature because it's messy and nature delivers the one thing that it can't handle and that's death it wants immortality, it wants continuity, it is a kind of a war machine for protecting the ego. And it wants that ego to carry on eternally like a cypress tree, like something that never dies. Completely unnatural to nature, and it should be struck down by the gods. What that means is struck down by the rest of your brain. There is a time to live and there is a time to die. There's no time for eternal life and life is messy. But life is sacred. Life has preeminence. We should worship life. And this module, our alien cortex, is deadly. So the Ashlepian is either supposed to ground your alien cortex in reality, in nature, in its mortality, or otherwise completely get rid of it. And once I had that realization, I started to drift away from the cult because I realized that they were driving you towards nihilism. They were driving you towards to a hatred of life, existence, of consciousness, and a desire for this never-never land of conscious sleep. 
it's a contradiction. It, 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 it's, it's a desire to switch off the lights but still have light blaze eternally. And it's the epitome of madness. And that's what has overtaken our society in a large scale. Every invention we ever did was really giving a little bit of endorphins to this really, really sick part of our brain. And that was the genesis of what then I've been calling the alien cortex all along and then starting to realize that everything seems to come from that. The idea of Satan, the devil, God, they're all projections of this really disease of the brain that we've acquired. So that brings us full circle to the Aslepian and Aslepius and to catharsis. And the first stage of catharsis is to get rid of this, this module, to ground it um, and to bring it back into reality and mortality. Now the treatment in the Aslepian involved two phases. So the first phase was the cathartic phase, the part which had clean diets. It would have baths, it would have emetic purgation, um, really uh, get rid of, getting rid of all the, the toxins. Uh, it really looks very much like if you have ayahuasca or if you go and have one of these, uh, say if you go to the Amazon jungle and have one of these ceremonies which involves uh, ayahuasca, part of that is uh, emetic purgation, vomiting and really cleansing. So after that cleansing phase, then uh, came the incubation phase. Now, incubation phase, really everything that's going on in the Aslepian is really a kind of a do-over. They assume that if you've, if you've got sick, if you've got dissociated, you have to be reborn as another person. Now, what that rebirth is, a reborn again without this foul module, the alien cortex. You have to get rid of it and be born again without it. So everything in the uh, temples, for example, uh, the incubation room, the room where you would, you would sleep and dream with all the snakes, uh, the snakes themselves are a symbol of rebirth. So Asclepius's symbol is now used all over medicine. It's not the snake with the two snakes around a, a staff. It's the single snake uh, round a staff, and that's uh, Asclepius's snake. Now, why the snake? Well, the snake is always been, since shamanic times, a symbol of rebirth. Why? Simply because snakes shed their skins. So it looks like a snake is being reborn. It's leaving a dead snake behind and it's being reborn. And so that symbolism, if not an actual belief, was uh, really that a snake could be eternal. It could keep on dying and slithering out and carrying on. So that rebirth was reenacted. So in terms of the incubation, that is clearly symbolic of a womb. If you go to the temples, you'll see that after you've slept amongst all these snakes, then uh, you go through a tunnel. It's clearly a birth canal. And then once you've been through that birth canal, then you go on to the next stage after uh, incubation, and that's the dream interpretation of the dreams that you had while you were incubating. So in other words, the dreams would be interpreted by a priest, and then the priest would prescribe the therapy that you needed uh, to make yourself whole again. So, yeah, you thought that Sigmund Freud invented dream therapy, but, yeah, C.J. Jung and Sigmund Th Freud, they were just plagiarists. They just went back to all these ancient things, and they, they, um, they reinvented them, really. I just stole them, really. <laughs> they, they were pure plagiarists. But anyway, the dream interpretation was pretty Freudian, apart from all the everything is involved in sex, um, really it is everything is involved in the divorce of this toxic module in your head. It's a divorce from reality. And now we, we have, uh, you know, electro electronic uh, attention deficit machines, you know, your Apple icon and all these cell phones and stuff that the internet has really taken us off into a very sick world, this dead world um, of the alien cortex. And that's why we're all going to die.
It's as simple as that. Uh, we've we've worshipped God, uh, and it's a big mistake. By God, I mean this. This is what God is. This is also what Satan is. And if you don't believe me, then <laughs> stay tuned for the next episodes, because by the end of it, I don't think there'll be any doubt in your alien cortex that that's what's been going on.